keynote speaker. I'm very, very pleased that she's come here um, to speak to us from Montreal. She's, um, you're writing a book about that, this, aren't you? Yeah, so she's um, famous now, but she's soon to be infamous. What? <laughs> Pearl is a lawyer, she's an author, she's a teacher, she's graduated from McGill and Oxford. Um, her, she has a number of specialties that are all to do with human rights. But her specialty right now is she has been tracking, um, as a member of Voices Wa Coalition, um, the um, wrongdoings of the Harper administration. So, you know, this is a wonderfully useful thing to do because um, if uh, all of us, we hear on the news, we see online, whatever, wherever we get our news from, um, from um, co-workers and we say, oh my gosh, now this has happened and then we, it's hard to track all the things that happened last week and the week before. So Pearl is going to talk to you today about the State of the Union in Canada and um, the efforts that have been made, successful efforts, some of them, uh, by the Harper administration to stifle dissent at every level, not just at the, uh, the, the dissent from people in the street, but dissent and information flow from government employees who are hired and there to um, uh, find and um, secure and disseminate information. So, um, without further ado, Pearl, thank you very, very much for coming all the way to give us this talk. I'm acutely aware that I'm all that stands between you and your Friday afternoon beer. Uh, so, I'm going to try to be quick and um, um, uh, relatively succinct in the time that's been given to me. Uh, I'd like to thank Lawyers Watch Canada for inviting me to be part of this event and also to the organizers and sponsors, Amnesty, the BC, CLA, the Council of Canada, the SFU Continuing Studies, and I would like to also acknowledge the fact that we are uh, on traditional uh, Aboriginal land. I was going to try to pronounce all three nations. I won't. I'm from the East, <laughs> forgive me. Um, but I think it's uh, uh, Slayatuth, uh, uh, Squamish, and Musqueam. Um, so the title uh, today, Advocacy and Dissent in Canada, State of the Union, of course I'm not referring to our union friends to the self, but I'm referring to the union uh, of concepts uh, between uh, advocacy and dissent. Uh, in today's environment, I think we need to ask what's happened to these words. Simple, powerful words like advocacy, dissent, and activism that were once the ramparts for free expression, assembly, and association, the power sources, if you will, for Gandhi, King, and Mandela, but more recently, the Arab Spring, and closer to my home, the Maple Spring. The current government of Canada is transforming these words, and they have acquired something of the whiff of sulfur about them of late. And this is an alarming development in a country like this, like Canada, especially on the eve of the 64th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. Of course, we Canadians think of ourselves as champions of human rights, heading the way in the international community, forging, uh, forging excuse me, a strong consensus for human rights and tolerance at home. And I think there are serious doubts today about whether or not the reality of this consensus is still accurate. It is true that there has been a long-standing and non-partisan consensus in Canada about the importance of human rights and tolerance. It's a consensus that has been shared by left and right, one that all the polls and surveys consistently report as being supported by the mass, vast majority of Canadians. I would like to suggest to you that this consensus and the structures that support it are being steadily, deliberately dismantled. In 2006, Ray Pennings and Michael Van Pelt, names that may not leap out at you, but both of whom are senior officials in the social conservative organization CARDIS, Michael Van Pelt was the uh, senior, one of the senior members of the board of directors in the push that overturned Remy Beauregard at Rights and Democracy a couple of years ago. Uh, together they published a signal article that appeared in the journal Policy Options calling, called Replacing the Pan-Canadian Consensus. And the authors argue, I think correctly, that the consensus about tolerance and human rights is giving way to an agenda that is less interested in both. Thomas Walken of the Toronto Star memorably dubbed this the new grim consensus. 
And the new grim consensus is being implemented at the federal level through a number of fronts, each of which targets advocacy and dissent. Now let me take a minute to put some caveats uh, into this. I actually have some sympathy for a government that is trying to make fundamental changes in policy and working to control its message. I'm a lawyer and an activist, but I've also worked as a civil servant. I spent 10 years in both the federal and, the federal and, and provincial governments. I'm sensitive to how difficult it is to implement new policy in an open and safe environment for discussion in public servants, let alone the challenges of steering the large, uh, still large, despite recent efforts, ship of government in new directions at a time of significant downsizing. I'm also sensitive to the fact that not every refusal to disclose confidential information is necessarily a gag order, or even an infringement of free speech. Media are always the first ones to leap onto this. Uh, the media themselves, of course, who routinely refuse to disclose confidential sources uh, for their own mutual protection, and that's probably the right outcome, but I think we need to be careful about how we throw <coughs> the accusations around. Moreover, I have nothing in particular against the long tradition of conservatism in this country. So what you're about to hear is not a partisan political position or a reflective reaction against conservatism. I have my own personal political views, but that's not what this is about today. The Harper government is democratically elected. It is not surprisingly implementing the program that it said it was going to implement. And that is fair game. And it's part of our democratic process, even if we, you, I don't like it. But what I'm going to talk about today is something that goes well beyond the fair and foul of the worst partisan politics. Even, even as a former public servant, it occurs to me that what has been going on is at very least a reckless disregard for the public space available for advocacy and dissent. Again, I would suggest to you meaningful for the exercise of fundamental rights. It is slowly shutting down progressive civil society, and I underscore the term progressive and subjecting it to terms and conditions that it would never dream of imposing on the private sector. And in response to these concerns in 2010, a group of us came together because of a growing and shared concern that something more was going on than a new government's growing pains or a new majority government's growing pains and policies. Um, today, too, thank you. To date, 218 Canadian organizations have publicly subscribed to voices in the steering committee are included Alex Neve of Amnesty International, Robert Fox of uh, Oxfam Canada, CCIC, uh, a number of other organizations, uh, lawyers, activists, etc. 4,765 individuals have signed on to voices and I would urge you when you leave today to go onto the website of voices foi and sign on your organizations. Uh, or uh, yourselves in order to first respect the right of freedom of opinion and expression, act in accordance with Canada's democratic traditions, and of course commit the government of Canada to transparency uh, in its actions. Voices began documenting instances of advocacy and dissent and where those instances have resulted in uh, the suppression of advocacy and dissent. And we began by focusing on the defunding of civil society organizations, especially long-standing development partners. These names should be familiar to you. Kairos, Match International, CCIC, and most recently, Peace and Development. But four additional fronts, in addition to the defunding of civil society, have opened up in uh, the mapping of the assault on diverse voices, on democratic dissent, and on the very fabric of progressive civil society, bringing us to a total of five. The vilification of human rights leaders and civil society leaders, a clear link to the human rights defenders talk that we just heard, in part for the demonization and the delegitimization of advocacy and dissent. A pincer movement that is designed to crush the funding of civil society organizations on at least two fronts, resulting in the constriction of the legal and public space in which these organizations operate. Third. A two-track strategy of either ignoring or directly interfering in the work of parliamentary agents and arm's length organizations further concentrating power in the hands of the Prime Minister's office. Fourth, the death of evidence, and I'm stealing that from the name of a science organization uh, by that same name, that would otherwise be used to support progressive CSOs, civil society organizations, and track the progressive realization of rights. We've seen the shutting out and shutting down of knowledge, research, and data, and the public infrastructure that supports these vital resources. Fifth, 
and interconnected with all of these, of course, is the systematic marginalization of human rights and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as both byproduct and target of these planks. I'd like to give you a brief survey of what the documentation project has done to date before uh, giving you a brief overview of each one of these five areas. We've identified 114 cases of what we call our hit list. Organizations, academics, and individuals who have been targeted, vilified, or selectively defunded, again, on the progressive side of the agenda since 2010. CSOs are overwhelmingly the focus, the red bit you see here, um, but public servants and academics as well have also been caught up in this. So uh, public servants are the second largest piece and the smallest one are academics. I have to say this is not a comprehensive a survey of what's going on. New incidents come to our attention every day. We're almost completely volunteer driven and we simply cannot track and keep up with them all. Several organizations have asked us not to document their cases because they are in fear of further losing additional funding that would completely result in their uh, complete uh, elimination or destruction. In other words, uh, they need to live to fight another day. Third, there are $5.2 billion in cuts at the federal level, multiple cases of legislative rollbacks of rights programs and inappropriate and excessive muzzling of public servants and scientists who are in the public service. These factors make it very difficult to assess what is actually going on or what the real impacts or targets of are on the cuts. Uh, as many of you know, Kevin Page, whose job it is, is to find out information about how the federal government is spending its money, has had to take the government to court in order to get the transparency and the accountability context that the government itself implemented. With all of these caveats, among the 114 that we've identified, 17 have actually been documented to date, and all of these are published on the website. Here's the hit list. Uh, here's the first part of the hit list. Um, the demonization of dissent is the first category uh, that I'm going to talk about. This is the second part of the hit list, and this is all going to be up on the website as well. Um, but each of these in organizations, informations, etc., are all um, are all up on the website, and I say have all been, as I say, have all been documented today. Um, if you break down the 70 by cross-cutting themes, you'll see that uh, women's organizations and knowledge organizations, uh, including Data Statistics Canada, mandatory website, environmental data, the Aboriginal Statistics Institute, women's organizations resulting from the status of women cuts. And by the way, I was interested to hear the um, comment earlier about the role that LEAF used to play. The legal, and I had a conversation this week with a very close friend of Mr. Harper's, uh, who's working with him uh, on a number of issues, and I asked him what he was working on. He said, well, I'm, I'm looking at, at using litigation and using the LEAF model as a way of pushing the right-wing conservative agenda. And I said, well, that's very interesting. Who's funding you? And he said, oh, well, not the government. I said, so who's funding you? And he told me it's the Donner Foundation that's funding the Canadian Constitution Foundation and Peter Monk's Foundation. Uh, so the private sector money resulting in foundations is now directly going to play exactly the same role that LEAF used to play in what I would argue is a regressive agenda, uh, including one uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, directly um, uh, against a number of the rights uh, and equality rights in particular that we have uh, worked so hard to obtain. 